bonjour. Welcome to another edition of Café de René. I'm your host, James Tunstall. And before I introduce René, I want to say a big thank you to all the new subscribers. Uh, it's really exceeded our expectations. And yeah, this new year and all these new subscribers have been awesome. And yeah, I want to say a big thank you. And hopefully we can get them numbers keep growing. But you are here not for me. You are here for the start of the show. The one and only Mr. René Dupree. And René, you've brought another great guest and a friend today. Oh, Great guess is an understatement. Uh, people ask me about guys I worked with in the WWE. And by far the most entertaining in the locker room. <laughs> the funniest guy you'll ever meet. Uh, just one of the biggest hearts, too. Mark Jindrak. Yes. It's been a long time. It's going to be a nice little interview because uh, we haven't talked in so long, you know? So yeah. usually stuff. Yeah, they're the most uh, fluid, you know, like you oh, get, the sure. best, get the best little talks, you know, so. Well, basically, we're just going to catch up and have it every, the whole world yeah. see it. So, Good, so yeah, so the, the first time I met Mark, again, was 20 years ago. We were living at the Suburban Lodge in Kentucky, Louisville. And I think you gave me a ride. And then you played me, like, you had, like, a, a recording of you rapping. Remember, you did <laughs> record, like, an LP or some shit? And I was like, dude, this is this is awesome. You were a really good rapper. We, I, I, yeah, I used to roll this kid, this local kid. You, if you don't remember, his, uh, his name was Chad. Okay. And he always be smoking weed and stuff. And uh, so, you know, we, we hung out. <laughs> right. No, you were a great rapper. Also, one of the best verticals I've ever seen from a draw kick. I mean, what, what's your vertical, dude? Seriously. Well, I mean, what, what, well, what it is now is different than what it was, but right. What it was, I mean, it was, it was over forty inches, I think. You know, maybe more. It, it depends. You know, like I was always good at reaching the, uh, the height you make it. You know, like for example, like when I wrestled you, the, the first time I really busted it out and really, really made that my like thing was yeah. against you. Uh, um, was uh. Sly or was that again? Was Rob your teammate already? I don't uh, know, but we were me and Cade had a non title match against you guys. You guys okay. had the belts, but non title, and they put us over you guys. And I right. hit that fucking super drop kick. Cade put, put you up yeah. over his shoulder. I drop kicked. I like, you know, it was super high, but like when it's TV, adrenaline, your natural jumper, it's yeah. time to do it. Got your goal, just got to get up and touch those feet to that chest right below the chin, you know? Uh, and yeah. and honestly, it's really safe because if the guy just posts and gives you his chest, I mean, I'm good at just I just yeah. did a little tap and yeah. I'm gone, you know. So, yeah. uh, you know that originated with you guys, and then um, you know the thing about WWE, I, I felt like they're idiots when it came to uh, showcasing that. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. uh, you a guy, you know, in this case, me, and I think about it now, hindsight, like with a 40 inch vertical at six foot six, like. That shit was ridiculous. You got to find something to do it for that guy, you know? Even if you put me on fucking TV and just have me slam dunk and shit. I don't know. Fucking do find something. something, you know? And even, even I don't know if you remember, in the Staples Center one time, me and Orr were fucking around backstage, and there was some shit on the ceiling of the Staples Center. It was like 12 feet, 2 inches, okay? Yeah. And everyone gathered around. Shane McMahon was there. Vince was there. And like 40 people were in the hallway all of a sudden. And like I said, the... 12 foot two was ridiculous, but I jumped up and touched it. And everyone saw it. They, like they filmed it and stuff. It's like, even with the owner and all the writers right there, and like, you can't find someone doing that backstage, a, a position, like a better position. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just, so I always like think about that because when I went to Mexico, my jumping made me famous. And in, 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 my jumping made me famous. I was leapfrogging guys to where I was like, okay. I'm going to leapfrog you, but don't even duck under. Just run through. Right, right. Run. I seen it. I even tried yeah. one time, and I didn't pull it off. I tried <laughs> jumping. So a guy was running. A little guy was running. I tried right. jumping closer to the ropes so he could go under me, hit the ropes, and back under before I landed. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, of course, I crushed the shit out of his neck. <laughs> <laughs> that was a one, two, three right there. It was like a fucking body axe handle like I, but but you know like 
that was the stuff. And what I had to do, like all the ma- all the matches usually in Mexico were three on three. So I, what I would do for a finish of one of the falls, because we were best of three falls, was I'd have um, like Kenzo. Actually, Kenzo was my partner in Mexico at the Prince. Oh, that the- And uh, no, in um, CMLL. Oh, okay. CMLL. He started with CMLL, and um, that's what I used to do as a finish. And that got really open with the crowd. Was um, him and um. Uh, Actually, Alberto Del Rio, too, was our partner. Alberto Del Rio and Kenza would throw my opponent off the ropes, right. and they'd pick him up in a double, a double, like, uh, instead of Spine one person, person, a double, but yeah. And yeah. I would jump up and just fucking, yeah. and people were like, it, it was amazing, because, you know, for Mexican culture, there's not a lot of guys. Like, Alberto Del Rio was, like, the, one of the tallest, you know what I'm saying? Like, there, yeah. there's... Literally, Mexican people aren't very tall, and that's you know they're more towards Rey Mysterio's height than they are towards Alberto Del Rio's. Right. So you know, for for me to display that kind of athleticism as a big guy, you know, yeah. When all the and then and then you know, as I got accustomed to being in Mexico, I started doing the dives outside the ring. You know, those dives that Undertaker does at uh, pay per view. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Like, He's got forty guys catching him. Man, no sweat, dude. I I all I need is one guy. You don't even have to do anything. Just stand there. And I'll bounce off you, you know, like that's how good I got in Mexico to the high flying is because those guys are all fucking cats, man. Right. I mean, I've seen near destruction where like they should break their necks and they've somehow wiggled out of it with their cat like reflexes. It's it's it, it really made me and their bases, man. You know, it, you know, a guy diving is only good as their bases. You know, the, the fact of the matter is a lot of guys probably could dive in, in the United States. But it wouldn't be smart because somebody has to catch you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's always a problem. But uh, yeah, that 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 whole thing, you know, just um, that kind of led me the jumping thing, and also, which all started with you and um, Sly, right? Transformed into Mexico, you know, and 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 then the Mexico thing. Once I had the fans, I used the uh, WWE marketing. You know, like I saw, you know, I traveled with Ray and Randy, and I saw these big marketing guys from WWE and how WWE handled them. You know, even though I was fucking around and probably, you know, losing my position in evolution and stuff, I was I was gaining some, you know, good marketing strategies in my mind for, for yeah. you know, I went to Mexico. And uh, that uh, that's what made me go to Mexico is because I saw the opportunity, you know. And uh, uh, many, not many foreigners have luck in Mexico, you know. And uh, the last known guy to have really, like, uh, which we call the, uh, you know, uh, Extreme Heralds, um, or they call them Gringos. Us uh, was was Vampiro. The Vampiro. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before, I mean, like, and I'm talking to you, like, and everyone, uh, everyone passed through here at one point in time. I mean, yeah. like, Chris Wah passed through here. Chris Jericho was here for a while. Eddie Guerrero. Val uh, Venus. Val Venus, I believe, was the CMML. Val, in fact, Val Venus was the last person. The whole. Before I left w, uh, before before I left CMLL, I was the uh, I was the first ever American born champion, heavyweight champion, first ever. Wow. And that, you wow. know that comes eighty. I think they're up to eighty nine years. You know this year they're celebrating their ninetieth, eighty ninth anniversary. Wow. You know, so it talks about the history. Um, Val Venus was the last foreigner before me to hold that title, um, and I think they I forget what they called him there, but. Um, it was Blade, I think. Blade. They called him Blade. Uh, and, you know, Chris Benoit was there. There's a lot of greats to pass. Andre the Giant passed through there one time. Um, oh, everybody. Bad News Brown. Yeah. Triple Scorpio. Yeah. You know, yeah, but like, I, just, I just went, that's the last time I seen you was in Arena Mexico, uh, Dragon Mania, Ultimo Dragon Show. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Now it's kind uh, of cool. Yeah, that. Those, those were really good events, you know, and. Oh, remember it was really hot crowd, you know. Yes, like, that's how it was every Friday in Arena Mexico. Every single Friday, Jesus hot Christ. like that. Oh. And that's just think about that. I went to a, when I went to as well. Um, not only were they looking for the next foreign character, right? Like the hero type. Um, they were also looking. For, it was also a time when this guy called Mystico. His name was Mystico. Yes. Yes. He was super, super, super over. I mean, like, s- scorching hot over. And That's what happened, right. basically, I just got, I rubbed myself off of him because right. every night he was wrestling, there was 15,000 people every Friday. 15,000. And you remember from Dragon Mania, that, that gives you a taste of what kind of crowd, how hot it was, you know? 
Oh yeah. So I, you inject me in that. Like they're all looking there. They're all there for Mystico, but all of a sudden they're looking at this fucking. Wait a minute, who the fuck is this Marco Corleone guy? You know, and yeah. and and then I developed. They have a ramp there. Yeah. That's what really kind of put me over is is I started doing this. I call it the Air Corleone. Yeah. And I used to run down the ramp and just jump over it, like. You know, and and back in the day when my knees were good and, you know, bodies, bumps didn't hurt as bad on your body. And these, yeah. I was like, literally like, I would get down that runway and run down the ramp and jump. And literally, like, if there was no ropes on the other side, I would have flown out the other side of the ring. <laughs> it, was, it was ridiculous. And like yeah. that, like in a, in, a, in a course of like three months, literally three months, I, um, became babyface there you know i said they started off me as, as a as a rudo as a, a rudo a heel a heel they call rudo um but yeah and the rest was history so you know but um yeah that's pretty much but, but that all stemmed from like and, and and all this happened in the course of like you know so quickly you know uh, everything i thought i could do in wwe was happening in mexico like overnight like overnight and uh and it was it was like you know i it was it was kind of strange because the last you know like my all my time in wrestling you know like it's it was great but it was like i kind of underachieved you know like yeah i could do fucking 360 dunks and i had a 40 inch plus vertical and you know i i i can move really well in the ring and stuff and i had a really good punch and stuff i don't I, it was you right renee with the time we uh <laughs> we were in a house show and they said just punch yeah. me he punched me and yeah. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, what? Yeah. I was a fucking I, I know. Here's the story. So I project, went to I was a fucking deer in headlights. You fucking deer in headlights, Mark. I went to fit before because we had our little <coughs> teen or whatever, and then right before the match, I go to fit. I go fit. Is it okay if I do this? He's like, sure. So then we get in the ring and I just called you just just punch because your punch was awesome. Yeah, they just made it my I, fit. I, I just called it on the fly, just one punch, oh. boom, knocked out, one, two, three. But the crowd popped because you're not expecting yeah. it, right? Yeah. You slapped me in the face too. You fucking gave me a slap. Oh, did I? Yeah, you gave me a slap. You said, "Hit me one, two, three. And I and I, I doubted you at first. I went to the right. rapper. I was like, Who? "Is he serious?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but and it worked. I love it. You slapped me. And I fucking reacted. Boom, and that was That's it. True. And but yeah, that punch. That punch. Also, I used that punch. Um, strangely enough, that was a huge, huge move of mine in Mexico. They loved it in Mexico. Yeah. You know, like it was just uh, because, like, you know, in Mexico, it's the formula match is the same match all the time. You know, it's you know, just like in America, the basic most of the time you got the, you know, baby face shining on the heel, the heel, you know, does something to cheat to get the advantage, lays the shit into him for a while, yeah. keep him alive, hopes, you know, hope spots and then go home. You know, in Mexican wrestling, it's three on three. And, you know, what you learn in america like oh you're it's your job to get if you're a heel your job is to get the baby face over you know like renee did probably most of his career yeah as a as a heel you know and uh like he'd always get me over by taking that shoulder tackle upside you know topsy-turvy out of the ring uh <laughs> you know that that stuff you know in in mexico that's you're not guaranteed that stuff guys don't a lot of times guys don't try to make your shit look good because because in, in mexico it's you know, if so, in, in WWE, if someone tells you, you know, okay, Renee, it's your job to get Mark over, or, or you know, it's my job to get so and so over, like that's your job, and you can get fired if you don't do it. In Mexico, it's like it's basically a three on three match, but it's really one on one on one on one on one on one on one. You know, six six people, but they're all against each other, fighting for like macho supremacy. You know, like wow. it, it, it's all based off of your high spot you know everyone gets a high spot like where you shine on everybody kind of you know well the, the opposing team um so as a baby face you had to have a good high spot and it was like a continuous spot on three guys it was, it was kind of cool yeah. um um but you know the usually you know three falls is a 20 minute match and it just you know it was it was different you know and for me getting out of that whole like you know you sometimes you grow up in america and the united states and it's always WWF growing up for me, and then WWE, yeah. and then WCW comes, and it's, you know there's WCW which I wrestled at first, and then WWE. Yeah. But just the, you know after a while, the big conception of wrestling was just kind of like the uh, uh, was it was just WWE. That's the only show in town. About the time that I you know they let go of me 
in WWE. TNA was kind of coming about, but it just wasn't really a strong, strong presence. You know, it, it was just it was still a blip on the map, still, you know, and and it still might be, you know. So, um, but there was no other show in town, you know. So for me, it was like kind of, you know, you always think like the only way to get the ten five plus five is WWE. But like what yeah. I learned quickly is like when I got out and saw some of the other places in the world, like I went to Mexico and I was thinking to myself like what the fuck like right there's i walk into arena mexico and there's fifteen thousand people that are going ape shit and i'm like why didn't anyone ever tell me about this shit you know and and um you know or or, and i'm sure it's the same way in puerto rico and and then i experienced a little bit in japan you know and oh yeah you know you know you your your japan experience obviously is is better than bigger than mine but you know my point is is like there's other ways to get the 10 in your wrestling career. It doesn't have to be five plus five. It could be seven plus three, eight plus two, one plus nine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't always, you know, and, and I think that was always like the, you know, as you grow up an American, there's, there's things that are true. Like you always like, we as Americans believe that we're the best fucking country, we're the best, this, the best, that, the best. And then when it comes down to it, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing in wrestling um forecast is is like everything your condition they make the condition to believe that you know wwe is it that's it that's it one show in town one show in town one show in town and what's kind of fucking them up right now is wwe is is not only is the 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 foreign you know everything's kind of with social media and the internet and everything it's all one universal show now and you know they're stuck in their ways and if they stuck these continue to stay stuck in their ways it's going to drive them into the ground because these companies, like all these companies, like the the ones in Japan, like especially like New Japan for wrestling, they're invading America, and it's coming soon. You know, it's it's oh, Jesus sorry. Christ, they sold out the Garden, dude. Couple yeah, years. and yeah. and you know WWE, you know, unless there's some really really big big like you know showcase match, it's not a guaranteed sellout every single time. You know, Mez, that was the one thing about the Garden crowd. It's it's tough. New York's a tough, tough crowd, you know. And uh, their last holiday Madison Square Garden had just passed that they had. It usually sold five thousand people. That yeah. building holds twenty thousand. That's a quarter fill. Yep, and, uh, you know, and that's and you, you, then you see AEW. You know, they're they're taking over, man. I mean, like I haven't watched wrestling in so long. I I wasn't like I wasn't born in wrestling. I was more like an athlete first. Mm. Wrestling. In, you know, and I'm not afraid to admit it. That's, you know, but I, I respect the wrestling business, obviously. But, you know, Renee grew up in the wrestling business, you know. So, and you, as you probably can agree, like, this is a great time for wrestling because there's so many places a young guy can go, you know. There's so many yeah. avenues. You're not just limited. You can be a star in almost any place now. Look at Kenny Omega. Like, he, he didn't have to go the conventional WWE route, you know. He became famous by, you know, going through a different, by constant solid work and, you know, so this isn't like a big WWE bash, bat, bash and stuff by me and stuff. But like, um, you know, it's just great to see, you know, how your your career and my career have have went in terms yeah. of it didn't have to end all be all with where we met in w, WWE. Right. So no, you're you're very passionate about Mexico, like I'm passionate about Japan, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so much. I'm, I uh, married a Mexican girl. <laughs> I married a Japanese, bro. Yo, okay. See, there you go. <laughs> you know, the funny thing, uh, this is a funny thing, um, and this is why I bring up, I remember that one punch, one, two, three, because it was, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee now, and that's awesome. where that's where that punch was, the one, two, three. Was it really? Yes, yes. The nail in the room. shit. And, uh, you know, I used to drive by it, like, every day, like, in the morning, you know, on the way to the gym, so it, it, stuck, it, it stuck in my mind, you know, so... <laughs> Well, let's talk more about like OVW. Um, we could probably edit it out just so I talk. Yeah, about yeah. It. I remember we're in practice in OVW, and this is one of the most horrific injuries I've ever seen. I don't know. I don't want to give you PTSD, but you know what I'm talking about. No, no. I would jump out of the. Uh, oh my the- god! So every Wednesday we had our TV. It was OVW TV, and then there would always be a WWF agent come during the day Wednesday and have guys do practice matches. You know what I mean? Just to see where they were in their training. So Jindrak does his match, five, six minutes, and then he decides to jump from the ring outside of the ring, lands right on his ankle, and his ankle is usually, it's like hanging off. It's just a stub. It was, dude, 
Oh, I it was a you know, the crazy thing about it, it was just a dislocation. It was it didn't fracture. Which no I shit. Wow. Which I would have fractured because it would have been a, a quicker heal. But it was it was all it was is a dislocation. And unfortunately with a dislocation, what it did why it was so gross, it spun around. You know? Yeah, like, it did, yeah. Like it and when the funny thing was, I think it was a day before Halloween, so it was that that's what kind of was funny too. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it was Arnold was there and yep. uh you know, I I can't I like I catapulted my so I went in the corner, and I catapulted myself out like so I jumped like in the corner but I kind of like, just kind of like let myself out like you know how you jump from inside of the ring to the the apron yeah you know from the corner there yep. I just that it's landing in the apron I just continued all the way down and uh, I had sneakers on I had a pair of Jordans on yes and, uh, yeah it spun around and um but yeah you, I, yeah that injury I mean to be honest it was a the longest part was just getting the swelling out. It was a dislocation. And, and the problem is with um, dislocations is uh, you're, the reason why our muscles are, are, are things don't dislocate like that is because our muscles keep everything in place. Well, in that case, when it comes out of place, it's the muscles sometimes that keep it out of place, you know, as well. Yeah. So yeah. It, when I saw that, I tensed up and it wouldn't go out, it would go back into place. So that's why I had to go to the um, hospital and stuff. But they put me under and they, you know, adjusted and stuff. And then it was, it was just a long, like a three to four month rehab process where I had to just, your, your ligaments get stretched out more than anything. It wasn't a fracture. It just had a lot of inflammation. So you had to do a lot of cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot. But, um, the good thing was it was my, on my left foot. Um, and I'm a right, like I'm a left hander. So I'm a right foot jumper. So it didn't affect any of my jumping ability or anything. So, I think shortly after that, you must have debuted, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I debuted in uh, Nitro, or not Nitro, in um, uh, Raw in Montreal. Right. And I wrestled Chris Jericho. And, you know, like, that's the thing, too. Like, that kind of was a shit because uh, that lead in, because. It wasn't like it was my first match on Raw, you know, and it wasn't like a. It, they made it make a big deal. The deal was like about Chris Jericho had cut a promo earlier dissing like Montreal Screwjob or whatever. So it wasn't even about me, you know. So like, it was just like, well, this is weird, you know. Like I said, like sometimes in life, you know, timing is everything, you know. And, and when something, when things don't occur for one reason or another it's not meant to be it's just not meant to be you know and and you know so do you, lot, think, do you think like the way that a lot of those ex wcw guys were looked and, and treated in wwe affected you you think that had anything to do with it um what do you mean like well a lot of the ex wcw guys were just brought in to you know be annihilated basically i mean you look at Scotty Steiner, and then you oh, look well, at... Yeah, yeah, well, um, I mean, kind of, sort of, but, like, I, I think we were, we were all given a fair shot, the young guys, you know? You mean yeah. from coming over from WCW over to WWE? Yeah. Yeah, um, I was fortunate because, like, there were only 10 guys originally that signed, that were WCW, that signed right away with WWE, you know, okay. within... They kind of like shut shit down and then we were on, they just kind of kept us at home for a few months. But like, uh, all the, it was all the young guys. It was all me and all my friends, basically. It was me, Palumbo, O'Hare, um, Johnny the Bull, Daisy Act. Um, Johnny the Bull not wasn't, Johnny the Bull, I think, had a different contract. So, and that was the, that was the, the stuffy part. When you had more WCW contracts, like all, those guys were all getting fucking paid. Uh, we didn't. Yeah. That payday, you know, we kind of they threw us on like as a hail mary, trying to trying to save everything, you know, and trying to, um, you know, save the company or get ratings or something. And it wasn't, you know, to be honest, it was it was just it was already it was too far deep, you know. But they gave us an opportunity, but they didn't pay us a whole lot of money, so we were the, you know, they picked us up pretty quickly, you know, all us those guys I just mentioned, um, the people were not like like Shane Helms, people didn't have high high contracts you know right um and a couple bigger names you know but guys that were more willing to work with them you know like uh like a ddp maybe right because he was his arc because he was a mark for himself <laughs> <laughs> i work for three bits 
Mark, I work for free. <laughs> Put me on. Oh, uh, you was when they brought you in back. Um, obviously, I know Palumbo got the push. I spoke to Palumbo earlier this year. Great guy. Um, but when they brought you in, they didn't put you in the WCW invasion angle. They kind of brought you straight to developmental. Was that always the plan, or was there any plans for you to be part oh, of the WCW? I was, in the, I was in the invasion angle for a, for a, for a little bit. Um, right. Act like when all the shit went down in Atlanta the one time, where like it was us five and it was five WWE guys in the ring all at the same time, and all of a sudden ECW came from the right. Yeah. I was a part of that, but like shortly after that, they sent me down to developmental. That was where, like, that's where it kind of, like, you know, I, and, and it was, w, WWE was in the right to do that. Like, they sent me in O'Hare, um, a few others, like Mike Sanders, um, guys from, you know, from WCW that were young like me and stuff that were a little green still, you know? All and great ball killers, yeah. And, uh, ball killers, sorry. Yeah, and uh, that was fine. You know, we we... You know, we learned how to, you know, as Rene will tell you, like in Louisville, it was, you had to learn how to work quick, you know, because everybody was so, you know, that was the future of wrestling right there. We we really didn't know at the time, but like, we kind of knew it, but like, at that, all that one time, like, it was pretty much the next 20 years of wrestling, you know, like, yeah. the Ordens, the Lesners, the Batistas, the Mia O'Hare, Rene, uh, Rob, Bashams, Nick, Nick Densmore, um, you know, I could... I the list forever but like at that one point in time it was it was that big you know and, and um so uh you know it was a great time and, and and i had no i learned how to work there you know like i i started using my athleticism mixed in with how the wwe wanted things done and you know we had dogs man and i thought at one point in time at that place like we were all ready. We were all like hungry lines ready. We could all cut promos. We used to do promo practice. We used to fucking that was pretty fun cutting promos. You bet you better stand back and don't try me or you're gonna get trapped. Remember? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> remember I told Rip, I said, you know, basically I said, My name is my name is uh Mark and I'm ripped. I said, but your name is Rip and you're Mark. <laughs> and, the, and the whole fucking, everyone exploded, you know, pop big time. And uh, oh, the fuck out. And so Rip went up and he goes, okay, rebuttal. And he went up and he, he cut a lame ass promo that wasn't as good. <laughs> so I got him that day. Remember I used to do all those fucking she read did, she read dead, she read it. dead, yeah, I remember that. Oh, it's funny. But, like, you know, we could all cut promos. Yeah. We could all work seven-minute matches, not even – don't just tell us who you want over. That's all we needed, you know? Yeah. Figure out the rest. Yeah. Um, it, got, it got that good and that fluid, you know? And, um, uh, you know, we're ready. We're ready. And, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes it was a bit much. You know, the bu sometimes the bumping was – more so in WCW when like they have TV cameras down, they want to show off, so they bump the shit out of us. Like, right? So, um, you know, like what what I wish I knew now. Like your your body, all we have those bump charts. You know, like you only have oh, yeah. so many bumps in your body. You know, and uh, yeah, just sometimes you know some some of the careless bumps. You know, and uh, but I guess you know you live and you learn. You know, and for the guys that don't do that kind of stuff, they they preserve their bodies a lot longer. You know, so um, yeah, that's key, man. That's the key. So, honestly, tell me now. You had an incredible career in Mexico. You had a few tours with New Japan Pro Wrestling. You had five or six good years in the United States. Well, what's 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 going on with you now, man? Are you done for good, or are you still getting you know, back, or what? To be honest with you, like, um, I have wrestled in over three years. That's for, first and foremost. I've wrestled. I've gotten to the ring. I've done anything. I've bumped nothing. Um, you know, still stay in good shape and stuff. I weigh about 240 pounds. You know, I'm still ripped as always, you know. Good day. Um, so in terms of bodies, like, you know, and I watch the show. Like I was saying, I watched the AEW show. And I, you know, it's made me start liking watching wrestling again. And, and uh, you know, just on that show alone, I, I, my body's better than 90% of the bodies on there. Maybe 95% already, you know. So um, in terms of that, you know, I'm still in good shape. The thing I'm afraid of, and I, and I think, like, if I get in shape, um, 
watching these matches, these TV matches, and these, you know, like the work rate, I, you know, I could definitely still hang. The right. problem I would have is going to that distance again, you know, to get, and you know what I'm talking about, Renee, you know, you know, when you take off time from wrestling or bumping or whatever, it's that part of reconditioning your body, the bump and those headaches and fucking sometimes you bump wrong, you take a bump wrong and you land heel first and your heels fuck for two weeks, you know, and, right. or, you know, you, you have a, um, you're hitting the ropes again and you got the, you know, this, the ropes are leaving a purple mark on your, on your back and your upper, upper quadrant, your ass, you know, and stuff like that. You can get through that stuff when you're 25, 22, 23, but now I'm 44 years old, you know, so it's a different beast, you know, so, um, I don't, I'm now living in Knoxville. I'm in a good area where like, in fact, here, Dr. Tom Pritchard's got a school with, uh, with Kane. Kane. They have a school here, and uh, you know I haven't looked them up. I want to look them up. I'm gonna. I just got here a few months ago. Long story short, what I'm doing, um, I'm big. I, I'm big into like sports collectibles, like baseball cards, basketball cards, football cards. It yeah. became a big boom lately, and uh, that's the business. That was like my passion. So I moved to a, to work for a company here, and what they do is they authenticate and grade cards. So I was a, a professional grader, like. So wow. thousands of cards from all over was, you know, people send their Michael Jordan cards in or their Wayne Gretzky cards. And we, you know, we professional graders, we sit down and we get, we put a grade on everything and, um, you know, it can really change the value of a card. You have a hundred dollar Michael Jordan card, but it grades a 10 that may sell on eBay for $5,000, you know? So wow. like now, like it's, it preserves, it preserves your, your investment as well. Like it, it puts it in like a capsule, um, a hard case and you can't, you know, it doesn't come out of it and stuff. And, uh, it puts a grade on it. It'll say, you know, it's, it's really nice. It's, and, um, you know, it's a trendy right now, you know, a lot of people got into it during the pandemic and boom. So, but, but long story short, I took the job here and I, it was best job ever. And within six weeks, uh, they laid me off along with 80 people. Like, uh, you know, it was just basically, unfortunately it was just, a, um, you know, uh, a business decision, nothing personal. So it sucks. So now I'm here in Knoxville and I don't know really what to do, you know, I mean, next, you know, for, for work or what my, you know, what I want to go into, you know, because that's, I kind of think maybe, maybe I just put some time into wrestling and take some dates in wrestling again, you know, so see if I can, you know, what's the worst going to happen. Right. Start to come back and it doesn't work and I don't do it, you know, I mean, that's the worst. Well, I mean, you're, you're right there with Dr. Tom. Just go and, you know, those guys go there, get in the ring, just do some cardio drills, get your time back, and then what the hell? Yeah. And with all the experience you got, and, uh, and you got a name, I don't see why AEW wouldn't just give you one one shot to see what you can do, you know? Yeah. Or even, like, you know, and I even thought about it, like, um, sometimes you know and, and and wrestling's been you know with hopefully with the pandemic kind of dying down now it's this fucking variants going again but like you know for a while their wrestling was kind of coming back especially indie wrestling you know and yeah. to be honest with you that's the kind of what i skipped over i never really indie wrestled but my time in ovw those church shows and those fucking other shows like i i fucking hated doing that shit because i just wanted it. once you taste the big time oh yeah the nice yeah. hotels yeah the, Everything that comes with it, you don't want the the crowd. You don't want to go back to fucking thirty people, and it sucks. You know, it sucks. Yeah. That you know, but like, as I as I'm older now, like, and and you know, I look back, like sometimes that appeals to me. You know, to like get my bag ready and just dumb it down. You know, keep it simple. You know, to you know, go to a city 120 miles from here. You know, and get on the highway. Um, you know, go and meet some guys, you know, fucking wrestle a match, you know, actually wrestle a match, you know, take your time, work a hold, maybe do something, stuff that I always wanted to skip over, you know, like I, that's the, that's the difference between you and me, Renee, like, like I said, you were born in the wrestling, where mm. grabbing holds, working holds, that was a part of you bringing up, you know, whereas I, I was brought up in a household of basketball and stuff where the glitzy dunk from the foul line was sweet, you know, so I, I learned the planches and the crossbodies before I learned the drop toe holes and shit, you know? So, right. Headlock takeovers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and obviously I learned that stuff in Mexico and I, you know, used it a lot, a lot more, but, um, 
you know, sometimes appeals to me, you know, maybe if I do start wrestling again, maybe, maybe a, um, a major wrestling company. Cool. Maybe not, you know, if not, maybe, maybe I work some independence here and there one a month or two a month, you know, I think that'd be fun. And to be honest, we, it, like sometimes, you know, what the, the biggest misconception you have one has as a wrestler is okay. I'm a retire. And when I kind of retired and moved over to the United States, I started wrestling. I started working a regular gig. I, I, I was a manager at a restaurant and that I had to get my wife's green card because she was Mexican, you know? And, um, so I did that. I just kind of never thought about wrestling, you know? So, um, and, and your big misconception is, okay, now I'm not wrestling. My body's going to recoup itself and you're going to, all the injuries are going to go away and everything's going to be, you know, perfect. It's not, it's not that at all. It's like, once you stop the injuries, fucking like, like, it's almost like your body needs the bumps. It, right. It's like, weird to say, but like it, if you don't get, yeah, if, yeah I don't know if it, the, the adrenaline or the a couple bumps or getting your head wrung a little bit doesn't that doesn't happen. It kind of you know it kind of like your body calcifies or something like it, it starts growing rust really right quick. And and another thing I've noticed too in this time off is your body starts like you know if you have a bum shoulder and you know if you have a bum shoulder for example and. Um, you know, the injury is just kind of like a lingering injury. Like when you stop wrestling or you stop stretching every day for an hour or 45 minutes, your, your body starts like, like not deforming itself, but growing how it wants to grow. You know, like before you train it, like, okay, I'm taking bumps and I'm fucking killing my back and shit. But like, you know what? I'm stretching every day. I'm doing fucking bridges. I'm, I'm going to the chiropractor every week. You know, like you, you, you make yourself sustain that kind of life. And when you stop, it's like your body just like, it's like almost like um, Darwin's theory. You know, if you don't use it, 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 you lose it, you know? And and in this case, like your body just kind of does what it wants to do. You know, if you've got a, a bum, a weird knee, your your leg will start growing like kind of crooked because it comp- <laughs> overcompensates the fucked up ankle dislocated, jumping out of the ring and your Jordan's on, you know? Like, <laughs> All right. So a part of me is like, you know, maybe it's just better off I stay in the fucking, get back in the game and just, like, get it over with, you know? Even if I bump five times one day, and then the next time I come, I bump ten times, and the next time I do, maybe, and then the next time I roll around, you know, take it gradually. But, like, I don't know. Like, that's the hard, the hardest part about ending a wrestling career. And not only did I end a wrestling career, when I moved from Mexico, you know, I was acting as well. I was probably acting more than I was wrestling, you know? Like, Let's address that elephant in the room. You know, like when I learned Spanish, I did a lot, a lot of acting roles, big acting roles in, in Mexico, you know. So that was another great source of income and and something you work towards as well. Because when you're on camera all the time, especially those HD cameras and shit and those TV cameras, like they pick up every fucking. So I was always ripped. I was always the best. You know, it was in Mexico, I was, you know, they took me as a hunk. So almost everything I did on TV the shirt was definitely coming off. Like, if I tried wearing a shirt on any any fucking TV show, they'd always, you know, the crowd would always, like, convince me to take it off, you know, like, you know. And I'd always have to do it, or they'd boo you, you know? So, a fucking shirt, I knew the shirt was always coming off. So, you like, when you're in TV or TV shows or programs or soap operas where you know your shirt's coming off, like, you always want to stay in the best shape, Um you know, and then when you come to America, back to America, and I'm not wrestling, I stopped wrestling, you train just like a normal person. You know, you do a little cardio, you do, you get in some arms, you get in some fucking back and call it a day, you know? Yeah. And uh, when you're a wrestler, you know, you train specifically to stay in shape. When you're on TV, you train specifically to stay ripped. Yeah. Um, you, when you're wrestling, you're always, you always need to stay limber and, and stretched out and shit because if you're not, the injuries happen, you know, constantaneously, you know? So, um, you know, so that's the biggest thing, but you know, overall, like I'm here and, uh, you know, I'm in the South, it's a new year. Um, I have a five-year-old uh, son, his name is Geronimo, my wife, she's, you know, I said she's from Mexico, uh, she loves it here in the United States. Um, so life is pretty good, you know, like I can't complain, you know, so, um, that's really what pretty much to your other son, Marcus. He's uh he's 21 years old now and he lives. Oh my god! Yeah, believe it. He was just little, maybe what, three or four when I met him. Yeah, 
Yeah. Now he's 21. He lives with my sister in, um, in Massachusetts. So, uh, oh. um, yeah, but he, he's grown up. He's not, he's not really an athlete or anything. Um, you know, I thought he would be, but he, you know, some kids don't like that shit, you know? So right. it is what it is. Um, but yeah, he's a good kid. And, um, and the five-year-old I have now, um, he's a good kid too. And, uh, you know, life is good. The, the kid keeps me, you know, kind of energized, you know, so, right. you know, they don't know they're five years old. They just see you as your dad and they want to play, 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 play. They don't know that you fucking bump for 19, 20 years. And, <laughs> right. Like right now, like, I, like the issue I've been dealing with the last two or three days and now maybe you've ever got, I got a pinched nerve in my fucking shoulder, neck oh, region. I've had, it my, I've had it in my back before, but you got it in the yeah. shoulder. And it's, the thing about, you know, there's difference between there's muscle like spasms and, you know, knots and stuff. And then there's nerve pain there. Man, nerve pain is a different level. You know, there's really sometimes there's not a lot you can do for it. You know, like there's muscle pain. You can take you get a massage, you can massage this shit out and you can take some Advil or whatever or whatever, you know, to help you. But like with nerve, that shit radiates, you know, like it can start a point right here on your neck. And by the end of the day, if you start fumbling with it and playing around with it, it can lead down your arm, down your freaking, you know. So, um, but the great thing is, you know, we just talked about social media and stuff. You, I hop on like Instagram or TikTok and there's a million different remedies, like stretches and shit you can do to relieve it. And honestly, like, um, I'm finding relief in it. So, right. so, so, so far, so good. But like, you know, my thing is, is like, if I'm getting fucking stupid ass, you know, spasms and not doing anything you know I, I think i'd be better off just you know getting back in like super super shape and like just kind of seeing what happens you know um because uh you know, a lot of you know and where are where are you currently are you in japan currently oh no i'm i'm up in canada bud okay east coast yeah <clears throat> but yeah i mean you gotta everything happens for a reason man maybe uh the good Lord sent you to Knoxville to go see Dr. Tom and, and Glenn yeah. and work out in the ring and, you know. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe. Um, maybe. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and, you know, I have a lot of good friends from Mexico, too, that are are pretty big, big players in the game as well. Like, you know, uh, there's a guy named uh, Rush, Rush. Um, yes. Uh, like he's uh, he's not right. he problems right now. He hurt his knee, he got an operation, so he's rehabbing it kind of still, but He's a solid up and comer. Like a lot of people consider him top ten in the world right now. Like in terms of you know up and coming guys, him and I like you know I know if I ever worked an angle with him, he's a guy that is really really intense, but really really good worker. Like you, he does his fucking running jump kick in this like where he's the guy sitting down in the corner. Those the horns. Yeah, the, the horn. Man, yeah, it looks. Like, it kill. It hurts if if you try to, you know, and this is true with anything in wrestling. If you try to like you know take a shitty bump or not take a shitty, that's when you get hurt, you know? But if you yeah. put your chest out, and he, you know, he comes with it, but it's, he's a super nice worker, you know? So guys like that, like, I know I could work, I, I, I worked a lot with uh, Andrade, you know, and um, over there in AEW, he's a, he's one of the best workers around as well right now. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, a lot of guys that I've helped along the way and worked with uh, along the way, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure they'd probably help me out, you know, give me some trial matches or, you know, just get me on the dance floor, you know, and uh, uh, if I, if need be, or even work me for that matter, you know. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's not really about, you know, how much physical shape you're in. It's got the guy you're working. You know, if you're working with a guy that makes you look good and is a good worker, you, sometimes it's the easiest job in the world, you know, so. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so I don't know. You know, right now it's just kind of playing – playing things out and see what happens. But I relax every day, play with my son, and, you know, whatever happens, happens, you know? Yeah. Well, I, for one, would love to see you back on a, on a national level. But uh, thank you so much for coming on. Like I said, in the locker room, one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet in your life. I uh, enjoy traveling with you. So do uh, you have, like, anything you want to promote, social media, anything? No, no, nothing – I really, not really. <laughs> <laughs> hey, kind of like me. <laughs> yeah. One last question. Like, you. Uh, fans, of, if, these fans, if they if they want to get a hold of you, they'll find you. There's, you know, right. shit. Right. You know, so, but yeah.
But yeah, nothing to promote. Uh, right, one last question um, before you leave. I watched the Ruthless Aggression um, inter- uh, documentary on the network last year, and uh, you was one of the main talking points with the evolution and that. And I noticed WWE, and we, you mentioned it earlier, like WWE is in that bubble, and it, to them it was like once you left, that was the end of your rest of career. But that was they, they kind of look at Renee the same way, even though the two of you had great careers in Mexico and Japan, respectively. But yeah. What did you think of your portrayal on the documentary and Triple H basically saying they kicked you out because they think you was a bad influence on Orton? Well, I mean, it was, I mean, he was kind of spot on. I mean, I mean, in terms of, it's funny how blatant he was. Like, he blatantly buried me. You know, like, yeah. some of the things were false. Like, I will tell you, what was true is me and Orton were fucking, you know, like, he was, he calls jack offs. We were jack offs. And Renee will tell you, like, a lot of guys, like, we travel, me and Orton would travel together. And, Sometimes guys would make the mistake of like, like one time, Rosie, God bless his soul, Rosie didn't have his partner to travel with. I forget who he traveled with, but he he wasn't on the tour one week, and he he asked me to hop in with me and Orton, and um, I was like, yeah, sure. By the end of the fucking, by the time we got the raw, he fucking dipped another car. He was like, yeah, we're, I'm hopping rides. Like you guys are too much, man. You know, like <laughs> and we were, we were too much. We we goofed off too much, chasing girls too much. Um, you know, and, and they're right to, you know, they're probably right to split us up because it probably would have continued, you know, and, and as soon as they split us up, he took it a little more seriously and, you know, he was a world champion not too long afterwards. Um, but it was just kind of funny how Triple H, you know, was so blatant with, yeah, me and Rick didn't want him in the group. It was him that Rick, it wasn't Rick, you know, because like I can tell stories where like me and Orton were in the car riding with Flair and Triple H. And, tri- and the problem was, is Triple H wanted to talk about, like, fucking hot tags and shit, you know? Like, a three-hour ride, he wanted to talk about, you know, arm bars and hot tags and shit for three hours. And, and I understood it, you know? He wanted to talk, you know, X's and O's. But, like, Flair wanted to talk about young stuff, like girls and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know? So, he when he said, like, oh, me and Flair thought it was a bad idea, it was, it was just Triple H, you know? Yeah. And... You know, and uh, that's that's and then the portrayal is kind of weak as well. Like, if you watch that thing, you literally think if you didn't, if you weren't a wrestling fan or didn't know I went from Mark Jindrak to Marco Corleone, yeah, like literally, you would think, hmm, I'll put I'm not a gambling man, but I'll put a hundred bucks and this guy's a crackhead in, in a year, you know, right? Right, you know, they make it look like it was the end all end all be all, you know, like yeah. he didn't he didn't make evolution so. Oh, let's kill himself. You know, like it's, it wasn't like that at all. I went and regrouped, and you know, I fucking I regrouped and uh, went to Mexico and had a great career for myself. You know, so um, that's the betrayal. But that's they're always gonna do that. But they always get a yeah. you know, TV. They always make it like they're the first, the end, and you know, in between everything in between. You know, so I I understand. But like, you know. For any wrestling fan that knows, like, you know, and, and that's why, you know, recently I've been kind of, like, releasing some of my, you know, all these tapes I have on, like, these drop kicks, these super high drop kicks. I just started oh, releasing lately oh. on my social media, which people oh. didn't see, you know, so oh. everybody arguing over, like, who's the best drop kick, like, oh, I, Mr. Perfect, you know, and I said, listen, no, no disrespect to Mr. Perfect, he is more over in his pinky than I'll ever be. Oh. In terms of drop kick, you know, nobody hold. I don't find many people hold a candle for my drop kick. Like, like yeah. you're right up there in my book, dude. I know. Thanks. Like, yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, James, is that it? Yep. Okay. Yep. Mark, thank you so much, man. Don't be a stranger. And as soon as we're done editing this, I'll send it over to you. Okay, bud. Sounds good. Thanks. Right. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye.